Hello, everyone. Welcome to Feed Stuffs 365. I'm Sarah Muirhead. Today, we're going to explore a scientific breakthrough for helping producers improve sustainability and profitability of their beef and dairy herds. Joining us with all the details is Dr. Bill Julian, founder of Nova Biosciences. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for joining us here today. Well, I appreciate it, Sarah. It's nice to be here. For those of you that are tuning in, we want to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, feel free to post those in the chat area on your screen. If you're joining us from social media, simply post your questions directly in those channels. So, Bill, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about Anova Biosciences as well as a bit about yourself. Well, um, to answer the first question, um, Anova Biosciences is a company that we formed specifically to, to market this, the technology that we're going to speak on um, to into veterinary and for veterinary and commercial species application. Um, it was formed uh, about four or well, five years ago, and it's actually one of four companies that is uh, that it, that we are we, we control or we interact with. Um, as for me, uh, I've been around since Hector had a pup. Um, I'm. <laughs> we were just reminiscing, Sarah and I, about the old days <laughs> when my hair was blonde. <laughs> I guess we were. <laughs> I, I graduated with a, a doctorate from the Ohio State University. That's when mm -hmm. we figured that Sarah was about 12 years old then. Um, and <laughs> Uh, I went on to, to get a degree in veterinary medicine, and for the last 40 some odd years, we've been involved in doing research and applied biotechnology for veterinary and commercial species application. Um, this project, uh, that, uh, the Promogen technology, is one that we've been working on for the last 10 years, actually. Um, and it's probably, I've been involved in a number of um, research projects that culminated in successful uh, commercial applications. But this is the one that I think is the most exciting, of uh, most interesting to me of, of all those projects. So you're, you talk about how there's stress resistant biomarker proteins that are present in specific cattle populations. First of all, how common are those proteins in cattle and what exactly does that mean? Well, to start off with, um, these proteins are found in all mammals from shrews to blue whales. Um, they specifically, when we started this project or the core, what's core, the core science of this project is actually, was actually to develop a tool for human medical research. Um, and we continue down that path. Um, but because of the fact that our church of Pew is veterinary medicine and commercial species agriculture, we were able to adapt or, or develop at a, a parallel uh, rate uh, the application in for that for those purposes. Um, in terms of cattle, um, once upon a time, Sarah, when my grandpa was a was a, a, was a rancher, um, I think everything on the on the farm basically was had these were produce these proteins at at amounts or physical levels that that um, were needed. Um, to allow these animals to be successful. Um, what's happened in the last 40, 40 years, uh, inadvertently because of the way we've selected animals, some percentage of the population has lost the ability to produce these things in, in physiologically effective levels. So what we know today, um, there is about on average, it's just a general statement. Um, and we've tested thousands of cattle now, all breeds, both dairy and beef. And about 30% of the population that we've tested do not produce these things at effective levels. 
So would you say dairy or beef? I mean, is it 30 for both in terms of, or do you see dairy having having more of these uh, these proteins than say, say beef? Is it comparable or is there a difference? It's the opposite. Um, actually, there's a greater problem with a, a lack of, of, of uh, synthesis, for lack of a better term, in on the beef cattle side as opposed to dairy. And there's some reasons for that. Now, this is all my opinion, and people can shoot holes in it, but basically, um, you know, when you're breeding dairy cattle, you're breeding for one one trait, basically. And that's productivity, and you're breeding for casein yield. Unfortunately, with beef cattle, we're breeding for 17 different things that are physiologically in juxtaposition. And so it becomes, it's become more of a problem. Um, and the criteria for selection in beef cattle um, have changed as a result of what the market demands. And so today, you know, what we, and again, these are general statements, you know, the objective of beef cattle raising or breeding is to breed for rapid growth and frame size. Um, and, and that has presented some um, problems actually, um, physiologically. Um, as a result. So, so how does your test work? How does it, um, how does well, the, what do you do? Let <laughs> me go up. Um, uh, well, we're actually testing for three proteins that are produced by specific cells in the body. And so we can measure these in saliva and semen, uterine mucus, um, respiratory mucus, we can measure them in rumen fluid. Um, and the test itself is a, uh, an ELISA-based test. Um, we, we, in conjunction with uh, the medical school here, University of Nebraska Med Center, actually specifically uh, Dr. Tom McDonald, who was the, um, who originally uh, identified this protein that uh, at that time he thought the, the, that, that there was only one. We subsequently found out that there are three, but in his original work, he discovered it, characterized it in bovine colostrum, um, and uh, basically developed an antibody. It took him three years to do this, uh, that um, never gives a false positive, never gives a false negative, and works in every species except for rats. So basically what we're looking at is a, um, it's a simple um, ELISA test basically that, that is based upon an antigen antibody um, interaction. Um, there you go. So are you seeing many differences? I mean, are certain, certain breeds? I know you've looked at a lot of different breeds and you talked about how it's more, more kind of a beef cattle issue than say a dairy issue. What about different breeds within the beef sector? Do you see a lot of difference there? Yeah, um, the, the, the difference has to do with, um, again, this is what we believe. Um, it, it, it tends, we see more uniformity in what we would consider minor breeds. Um, and we've tested you know, everything from uh, obviously Angus um, all the way to, uh, uh, all Brocks to limousines, um, Delta Galloways. The, the 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 animals in these minor breeds in quotes tend to be more uniform in terms of their scores. Um, with Angus, um, we see more animals that are tend that score on more on the left hand side than the right hand side of the bell curve. Um, although we have found um, in Angus herds um, that we can find a, a basically that have selected inadvertently for these proteins where everything tests high. But, you know, we found other herds uh, that, you know, basically the, even though they didn't know that whether they, if they wasn't purposely selecting against it, where they animals universally uh, are testing more to the left hand side to the low side. So, what does all this mean for producers' bottom lines, be it dairy, be it beef? 
Well, basically, what, what, we, what we saw, you know, the very first experiments that we did were with dairy cattle, and what we, um, and, and we chose that model because it's so easy to measure response. And what we found is that high testing animals um, were, were significantly more productive. Um, they were more disease resistant. Um, they stayed in the herd longer. Okay, and so that, and it was easy, you know, it was subjectively easy to measure that. On the beef side, subjectively, we have we've discovered that high testing animals are more feed efficient. Okay, we have data that suggests that they are, well, they're more reproductively efficient. And um, that's, that's measured both whether you have a walking bull or in um, programs, IVF programs, uh, for example. Um, uh, we know also that where animals test, herds where animals test high, that again, animals stay in the herd longer. And, you know, and, 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 and longevity, productive longevity is, I, I believe, I believe, key to uh, anybody's bottom line. You know, I, it depends on how you talk to, you know, you, you break even on a heifer after he's had three or four calves. Well, most of them don't make it past two. All right. So the more those animals can do their job, the more money it is in your pocket. This other thing that's key, or I think is even more important today, is the idea that these high scoring animals are more feed efficient. Um, and feed efficiency is, is the basis of this interest in sustainable agriculture and sustainable ruminant agriculture. So both profitability and sustainability are, are things that we're looking at here when we talk about this technology. Exactly. You know, one of the problems with sustainability, um, we as an industry, uh, we're being lectured to about uh, the fact that, that, that we are uh, a, an industry that actually creates environmental problems where um, that's simply not true. Um, you know, even though we, we make with this 5 million people involved one way or other in, in ruminant agriculture and there's what 375 million consumers. So obviously we get the short end of the stick. But people don't realize though, again, in my opinion, that, that those 5 million people are, have been stewards of the land. Um, they're there and have provided if they protect the environment. Um, the, the sustainability, unfortunately, to the consumer means something different than sustainability, what it means to a producer. To a producer, it means profitability and basically be, the, the ability to maintain a lifestyle, chosen lifestyle. Okay. The consumer, on the other hand, it means uh be able to access an affordable product that was produced in such a way that it did not damage the environment and that it was done and the product itself that results from that um, is something that's wholesome and safe for uh, a housewife to feed to her family. Um, what we believe we have, and this is really important, is that uh, what I believe has to happen is that these two definitions of sustainability have to become synonyms, okay? By doing that, it makes sustainability, which is unfortunately something that we, it has to become an element in terms of the way we manage. We have no choice. It'll be legislated into existence. If it's better to be in front of it than have to fight it from back because you're gonna lose. Basically, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to, 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 to uh, uh, to do this, it, it turns, it, it provides an opportunity for profitability on the producer side. That makes Profitabil sense. Yeah, profitability is definitely needs to be a part of sustainability um, for, for all of us. I mean, if producers aren't profitable, they're not going to be around and then that affects consumers. So yeah, great points. So so what is next for ANOVA? What's, what's ahead? What should we look for? 
Well, um, we have um, mo that we've just introduced. Again, you know, I think I in our <laughs> pre-intermission interview here, whatever, I, I told you that you know every day there's always new questions. Uh, we continue to to find out more about what it is in fact is happening physiologically with these animals, uh, and and I think I shared with you as well earlier on that. Um, as a result of the work that we're doing today, I start to question things that I took as gospel, um, you know, from the time that I graduated from school, um, and that's important. So it, it it keeps. It's one of the reasons why I think what we're doing right now, from my from my personal pr perspective, is so so interesting. Um, we are working at ways. And we have developed, for example, an algorithm that allows us to um, predict the the ability of this what were these proteins to be produced um, in future in the next generation. Uh, you know what what we have discovered is that. Um, I mentioned earlier on that when Tom started this work, he thought it was one protein. We discovered that there are three. Um, what they are biomarkers for the simply way, the, the simplest way to explain it is stress resistance. But what we're measuring are proteins that are indicative of um, energy availability and efficiency of utilization of that energy at the cellular level. Okay, so we. Uh, uh, we've also have um, been able to identify that the inheritance of this, we can breed for this, by the way, um, is based upon maternal inheritance. Okay, and so we know that it is, we can easily recover what we inadvertently lost. Um, and we can do it um, simply by identifying those individuals that already have the ability to produce these proteins the way their ancestors did or um, and by mating those animals we can we can restore this um, this physiologic fact that I think is bottom line to profitable profitability and sustainability and I hate to keep hitting that nail on the head but they're important. Really about moving the industry forward is what I'm hearing. Exactly. I mean, we, you know, that the, there's, if you look at the, what DNA and genomics has done, it's, it's, it's been a very useful tool. Okay. Mm -hmm. What we've discovered is a physiologic way of enhancing the, 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 the value of DNA and genomics testing. Um, and it, it, that it, again is the other thing I, I'm, you know, I've, I think I mentioned to you, you know, most of my colleagues, in quotes, they're either dead or retired, so I don't have a lot of people to talk to. But the people that I do, you know, we sit around and spin yarns. Uh, you know, what, what we agree is that you know, some of what we've discovered, it, it makes us question or is repeating things that I took as gospel when I graduated from school. That's, that's what science is all about, okay? That's how you go forward. It's always that next question, answer the question. I, I live in a world that I believe I have to, based on what I do, is that a, a glass half full. You know, it's not a glass half empty. And that's what science is. It's a glass half full. Okay, why not do it? Rather than tell me, don't do it because for no, no reason. So anyway. Yeah, yeah. We've always done it that way. It's not the, it's not the answer. And that's, right? bull, that's bullshit. <laughs> that's why I said, like, <laughs> my mute button, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Any final thoughts you'd like to uh, leave our audience with here today? Well, no, again, I, I appreciate the fact that I was given the opportunity to have a bully pulpit here to lecture from. Um, it, it, and it's not a lecture. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've ridden this horse now for 10 years. Um, I know, uh, I'm confident as to the value of the, of the technology itself on a global basis. And I, I think that 
we happen to be in the, the right at the right place in the right time right now to take full advantage of the, the, the industry as a whole has an opportunity to change a business model that worked for donkey years but it's got to change based upon what's happening in the world today and and there's people that want to do that and and we think that you know what we have is a tool that that could catalyze that change um and something that other people can build on very good dr bill julian founder of anova biosciences thank you so much for joining us today great to see you again and some really insightful thoughts and some very interesting and important technology it sounds like you're bringing to the cattle industry well i really appreciate it don't make it so long sarah Not another 30 i know years. right we'll have to do this again real soon so <laughs> when I'm 104. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Likewise, we want to appreciate, we appreciate all of you that have tuned in today to join us. A reminder that you can view this interview along with a number of other Feedstuffs 365 exclusive interviews on Feedstuffs.com. Until next time, for Feedstuffs 365, I'm Sarah Muirhead.